The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. For 10 months now, it's been all hands on deck in Ontario's healthcare system battling this pandemic. But that hasn't meant a stop to cancer, heart disease, or car crashes for that matter. What toll has this pandemic taken on all the medical care that normally takes place? We're examining that tonight. Then we'll talk to filmmaker Ariel Nasser about his new documentary that uncovers the remarkable story of how Afghanistan's film archive was saved from the Taliban. It's Tuesday, January 12th, and that's next on The Agenda. As concern mounts that COVID-19 could overwhelm intensive care capacity in Ontario's hospitals, it's only the latest way in which this pandemic has dominated the delivery of health care. Think of all the tests, treatments and diagnoses that have not happened due to this emergency. With us now to assess that part of this crisis and, as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Kingston, Ontario, with... Dr. Chris Simpson, he's the incoming Executive Vice President for Medical at Ontario Health. In Burlington, Ontario, Dr. Jennifer Kwan, a family physician who does a lot of advocacy online around COVID education. In Brampton, Ontario, Dr. Naveed Mohammed, President and CEO of the William Osler Health System. And downtown in the provincial capital, there's Dr. Michael Schul, the CEO of ICES. It used to be known as the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, He's a staff emergency physician at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, and we're delighted to welcome all four of you onto our program tonight for, um, well, let's just call it a very important and timely conversation about all the things that are not happening while we're so deeply focused on COVID-19. I would like to just um, get each of you to weigh in from around our metaphorical table here on from where you sit, your particular part of the healthcare system, what concerns you the most about patient care while this pandemic intensifies? Dr. Simpson, start us off. Well, I think the, uh, the thing that is most concerning at the moment, Steve, is the extreme asymmetry in the way that COVID is impacting uh, different communities in Ontario. So we see many hospitals in the greater Toronto area and some other hot spots like Windsor, for example, uh, where hospitals are starting to see uh, significant uh, ramp downs in scheduled surgical and procedural activity, and their hospitals are uh, really filling up where there uh, is apparently some capacity in other areas of Ontario. So that creates some inequities, I think, that are problematic. Dr. Kwan, how about you? Well, as a family physician, I'm getting worried about my patients' tests and procedures and surgeries that may be potentially impacted by uh, the way the healthcare system is being overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients. And I want to make sure that people are still getting the appropriate medical care, including going to the emergency room when they are having a medical emergency. Dr. Muhammad. Yes, you know, I agree with Dr. Simpson's asymmetry. Uh, the issue right now is the lack of care our patients are getting in every community. Uh, I know that Dr. Kwan is working hard in her practice, but a number of family doctors are not seeing patients in person, only seeing them remotely. And uh, some family doctors who are older due to the fear of COVID have actually shut down their practices temporarily. And what we're seeing is that the screening for things like breast cancers, colon cancers has decreased significantly. The people showing up in our emergency departments are sicker and the cancers that we are diagnosing are at a much more advanced stage. So not only is there asymmetry regionally, it's also in the type of practice that you're in and what resources you have to protect yourself. Dr. Shul, how about your experience at Sunnybrook? Well, uh, I think we have a very similar experience to what we, we heard from the previous three speakers. What I would add is that in addition to sort of a geographic inequity of COVID, there's also a social inequity of COVID. So we're seeing particular communities within Ontario that are being much more heavily affected by COVID in terms of cases and adverse outcomes and deaths. Uh, and these would include racialized communities, communities w uh, with multi 
uh, with housing environments that, that are much more likely to have multi-generational uh, uh, family arrangements living together. Uh, and of course, workers who can't work from home, who have to go into work. And that includes a lot of uh, healthcare workers who are being adversely affected. Dr. Simpson, let's just do a little math here. We are told that 400 intensive care unit beds are currently in use across the province of Ontario. I think we need to know how many do we actually have and how many do you think we're actually going to need? Well, yes, the, the number of uh, ICU patients um, having COVID uh, has gone over 400. Um, we're able to model out where it's likely to go with a fair degree of uh, certainty because, of course, ICU admissions and hospitalizations are downstream indicators and are a direct consequence of the new cases of COVID that are uh, diagnosed. So, in a sense, what's happening now in terms of the newly diagnosed cases can really accurately predict for us what the next uh, few weeks are going to look like. So, some of the modeling um, suggests that we'll be uh, above 500 by January 24th, which is not very far away. And the numbers, uh, if nothing changes, are likely to go to about 800 uh, by mid to late February. So, we have about uh, 2,100 ICU beds in the province. Um, um, the ICU folks will tell you that um, uh, about 75% of those beds are uh, taken up by people who just have to be in there. Uh, it's, it's unavoidable. So the COVID cases are competing for, if you will, for about 25% of the uh, total capacity. And, and we're at that point already. So Dr. Schull, let's just understand this. If, if we have the capacity of 2,100 and we're only using a little over 400 right now, but we might need double that, in a couple of weeks' time, fill in all the blanks for us. What does that portend? Uh, the, there are a lot of blanks, uh, and it portends a very difficult situation uh, inside hospitals. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's anybody to sugarcoat this. We're facing a potential uh, 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 crisis within hospitals in terms of the ability to cope, not just with COVID-19 cases, as has been described, but also anyone else. So those. ICU beds that are occupied with non-COVID patients, these are patients who've had heart attacks. These are patients who've had strokes. These are patients who have uh, infections that are unrelated to COVID-19 and require ICU care. Those things don't go away just because we have more COVID. Uh, and so we're going to need to care for those patients in addition to the COVID-19. So, I mean, the blanks will need to be a displacement of other uh, types of uh, care. So, uh, meaning ramping down any kind of procedures or surgeries for advanced cancers and so on, of patients that could end up needing ICU care. Uh, it probably means increasing capacity significantly. We've seen uh, you know, field hospitals essentially being built, and there's I know there's talk of more. Uh, it means looking everywhere within hospitals, including emergency departments, uh, to become sort of pseudo ICU beds. Um, and and this is not this is far from ideal. And it means that really anybody in Ontario is at risk here because you don't have to get COVID-19 to be affected. Uh, if you are in a car accident, if you have a heart attack, if your loved one uh, suffers from a severe infection and requires hospitalization. Every, anyone who is at risk of that, which essentially is everyone, uh, is at risk here. All right, let's do a specific example then. Dr. Mohammed, I'll bring you in for this. Your catchment area, in other words, the area that you're basically responsible for, uh, give us the sense of the boundaries. What are you responsible for? We're responsible for uh, Brampton and uh, North Etobicoke and uh, some of the Caledon area and some of the North Mississauga area. And this, this is traditionally where uh, most of our patients uh, come from. Okay, that's a big area, and it also happens to be an area where there has been a, a, a rather terrific, uh, and I don't mean that in a good way, I mean that in a big way, um, a, a serious concentration of COVID-19 cases. I wonder how many people, do you know how many people have COVID-19 in your catchment area right now? I don't know the exact number for the catchment area, but I can give you a sense um, when people are coming to our assessment centers, which is where people are arriving without symptoms just to get swabbed because they may have been exposed or a family member may have been exposed, our positivity rate right now is close to 25%, which means that every 100 people that are walking in to get their nose swab, 25 are positive. And when we go to our cold and flu clinic, which we have converted our ER at uh, Peel Memorial into, the positivity rate is 41%. These are huge numbers. Our hospital right now has close to 170 COVID patients. 
20 in our ICU. And without the help of the incident management system, which is balancing out all of the patients across the GTA, uh, without that, we would be in a very difficult situation right now. And I'm really afraid of what will happen over the next four to six weeks uh, unless things change. Well, uh, just before I ask you a follow-up question, let's put this in perspective. A 25% positivity rate in your area compares to about a, I think I saw the number yesterday, at 5% for the province as a whole. So that is significantly higher than the rest of the province. Are you actually able to take care of all of the people who will require help? In other words, do you have the ICU capacity at your facilities in order to meet this challenge? So I just want to clarify before I answer the question, the 25% is in our assessment center. In our region, the positivity rate is still at 13%, which is tw more than twice as what is in the province. Do we have the capacity to care for these patients in our ICUs and in our hospital? No, we don't. Uh, we, we have been a region that has been hard hit even during the simple flu season in previous years. Without creating, as Dr. Schul stated, uh, other ICU type locations, such as the old emergency department in our Etobicoke hospital, converting some of our other areas in the hospital uh, into ICU areas, or even renting out some space outside of the hospital to treat the not so sick admitted patients, so somebody that doesn't need an ICU bed. Without doing that, we will not be able to manage. Uh, we will need help from other organizations across the GTA and across Ontario, and they have been helping us consistently over the last four weeks, and that's how we've been keeping our head above water. Gotcha. Okay, Dr. Kwan, let me bring you in at this point here again. You work out of a family practice, but I gather that you have volunteered to work at one of the hospitals in Burlington. Give us some sense about what you're up to these days. So the Joseph Brandt Hospital in Burlington has set up a pandemic response unit, which is a, a tent-like structure outside of the hospital. So it's meant for hospitalized COVID-19 patients who do not need critical care in the ICU, but still need to be managed in the hospital with oxygen, uh, nursing care, things like that. Um, so it is a very futuristic uh, structure with um, many beds inside and uh, rolls with partitions between them. It's very uh, clean. The, the computer stations have keyboards that are easily wiped down, like it's all uh, flat. So I think it was built with uh, a lot of concern for infection control, um, especially if all the patients inside will be um, COVID-19 patients. So I'm still waiting to hear back by I am on the list to work there soon. And Dr. Kwan, how close to capacity is that facility? Can you tell when you're in there how close to capacity they are? So I was in there a few months ago for orientation. At that time, there were no patients inside, but I believe that it has been opened within the last week and patients have started to be brought in. And if it ends up being the case where they get full, because maybe the experience in Halton region is going to be you know, picking up in numbers as, as it is all over the province, uh, what do you do? What do you do when you hit capacity? Well, I believe this structure is also meant to help with uh, overflow of capacity from other regions uh, such as uh, Hamilton, uh, because not every hospital has this kind of pandemic response unit. So hopefully we will be able to help manage that from other regions, but I'm not quite sure what will happen if this gets full as well. All right, let me read this from the Los Angeles Times from just a few days ago, and this will give, give us all an idea about what other jurisdictions on this continent are dealing with. Stretched to the breaking point by a deluge of COVID-19 patients, Los Angeles County's four public hospitals are preparing to take the extraordinary step of rationing care with a team of so-called triage officers set to decide which patients can benefit from continued treatment and which are beyond saving and should be allowed to die. The county's top health officials have not yet declared a shift to a crisis level of care which would trigger the rationing system, but the leader of the public hospitals acknowledged in a letter reviewed by the Times this week that there will likely come a point when we simply don't have sufficient staffing or critical supplies to care for all our patients in the way we normally would. Okay, Dr. Shul, how close are we to that in Ontario? 
Uh, you know, it's, it's very hard for me to tell you at this stage uh, how close we are to that point. I think we still are a ways away, and I think it's our hope, uh, everyone's hope, any healthcare worker and any Ontarian, frankly, uh, that we may not get to that uh, point. But I think it would be really um, uh, very uh, uh, dangerous to assume that we won't get to that point or that we couldn't get to that point, that there's something different about Ontario. Look, what I think is very uh, encouraging uh, are some of the steps that, for example, Ontario Health has taken with respect to looking at all hospital ICU beds in the province as a single pool and, and transferring patients literally hundreds of kilometres uh, so they can get the care they need. I think that's a good step. And I think that's something that, for example, wasn't happening in the early days in New York City uh, when the hospitals were in some cases you know, competing with each other in a sense or, or not sharing resources. So that's a great step. And I think that's a, that's one of the strengths of our, of our health system. But the reality is there is a limited number of ICU beds. There's a limited number of beds that we can pretend are ICU beds. And if we exceed the number of patients who need those uh, beds, whether they're COVID-19 or, as we were saying before, other patients, we will have to make very difficult choices about who gets to uh, be in those beds or be on those ventilators and who doesn't. Um, so this is, this is a, a situation that we all want to avoid, but I think everyone knows is, is, uh, is a possibility here in Ontario, just as, as it is in LA, just as it was in Northern Italy or, uh, or, or New York City a few months ago. In other words, there's nothing special about us that says we're going to avoid all these other things if we continue to violate protocols and be stupid. Is that what you're saying? Uh, there is nothing special about Ontario. That's, that is absolutely correct. Maybe I didn't put it so elegantly, but we, we get the gist of it. Okay. Let's, okay, what do we want to do here? Sheldon, I want to go to the graph on page three right now, uh, which is, uh, let me take everybody back a few months. This was the surgical backlog created by the first wave of the pandemic when we were under the first state of emergency. And let's go back. This was a study published by the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and it found that between March 15th, the Ides of March, how appropriate, and June 13th, this is 2020, a backlog of nearly 150,000 surgeries was created in the province of Ontario by this pandemic. And the estimated backlog clearance time is 84 weeks, a year and a half. If an additional 717 patients are operated on weekly with an additional 719 operating room hours per week. So that's going to take some doing. Uh, Dr. Simpson, let me get you back in here. Were hospitals able to work through those numbers at the rate once operating rooms opened up in June? Yeah, it's a very complicated story, Steve, but I think you've got the essence of it. Um, there was a, a directive from the Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, back in wave one, which directed that all um, scheduled uh, things should should stop. And across the province, we saw the uh, rate of surgeries and procedures uh, go down uh, by about 88%. So it was a massive shutdown of so-called elective or scheduled procedures. The, the ramp back up was quite slow as well. And by the summer, we were sort of almost back up to our usual run rate. And in a few places in the province and for a few procedures, they were able to get above um, uh, 100 percent of their run rate. But the backlog was was not cleared by any stretch uh, this time in wave two. What we've tried to do is really put a box around the so-called time sensitive procedures. So cancer surgery is a is a good example. Some very aggressive cancers that have tumor doubling times of four or six weeks. You know, it, it's very intuitive how urgent uh, these are. And we've tried our, our very best uh, to, to keep those going. But already in the GTA, we're seeing that scheduled surgeries are down in most places by at least 50%. And we're really just at the beginning of uh, what the next two months is going to throw at us. In which case, Dr. Kwan, let's get a real life example here. Do you have patients who need surgical procedures who are not now getting them because of the COVID backlog? So for example, even for non-cancer surgeries, say someone has severe osteoarthritis in their hip, that can be a debilitating condition affecting quality of life. They're living in pain every single day, but they were waiting for a surgery date that may have been delayed in the first wave. And in the second wave, there was a constant anxiety about, is this going to happen? Am I going to get pushed back? I'm going to need more medication because I'm just in so much pain and I cannot, um, I cannot wait. I don't know when my date is. So they're not imminently dying from cancer, but they are literally suffering from pain every single day from arthritis. Fortunately, um, this patient I have in mind was able to get their surgery, um, which is really great. But 
it depends across the board in different regions regarding the wait times and backlogs. So unfortunately, in some areas that are more severe, I do understand that procedures and surgeries have been canceled. I, I, I genuinely don't want to be alarmist here, but I also don't want to sugarcoat this either. How concerned are you, Dr. Kwan, that you are going to have patients who are either going to get very much sicker or even die because they can't get treatment because the healthcare system is so focused on COVID? Well, the healthcare system is, you know, triaging and managing those that are emergent um, or urgent cancer treatments and things like that. But I also want people to understand that the healthcare system is available for you. So if you are having symptoms, you should speak to your doctor. The vast majority of family doctors are open um, and are available for in-person visits, especially if you do need to be seen in person. Um, so contact them and reach out because if you have a condition, um, you should speak to your doctor. And it's not just the healthcare system doing that. I think a lot of people are anxious about, you know, going out to the doctor's office. Is it safe? And even in my office, I am seeing delayed presentations of uh, medical issues that could have been addressed earlier and, you know, prevented the deterioration. Uh, so it's still very important to seek medical care. Hmm. Okay, Dr. Mohammed, I'd like to put your health system under the microscope for a moment here if we can. And just so people understand, uh, you don't actually run a hospital, you run a system. So the William Osler Health System consists of what? It consists of Etobicoke General Hospital, which is a full service hospital, including an ICU and an emergency department. Our largest site, which is the Brampton Civic Hospital, once again, uh, having one of the busiest ERs in the province. We have the Peel Memorial Center for Health and Wellness, which has an urgent care center, which is currently our cold and flu clinic, and a lot of ambulatory care uh, processes going on there. We have a withdrawal management center in Brampton, and we also have a floor at the old Humber Hospital called the Reactivation Center. So um, our surgeries currently are down to 41% of what we usually do, and those 41% consist only of cancer surgeries or emergency surgeries that need to be done right away. Okay, that's, that's five different locations that you're actually responsible for, all told in the William Osler Health System. And let's do the follow-up question here. How, how many employees have you got there in the, in the five different locations? If you include all of our employees and contracted employees that work in our organization, we're just under 10,000. 10,000. All right. And I presume they're getting tested all the time. So how many people under your purview have um, tested positive for COVID-19? The number of employees that are also employees that have tested positive are just north of 300. Currently, we have 50 active cases of COVID-19 in our employees. The problem with 50 active cases is that each other employee that was exposed to those 50 cases also needs to be off for 14 days. So if you take seven or eight employees that are exposed on a unit to one person that may have tested positive, that's 400 employees right now that we cannot access to provide service. So you've got, you know, on the one hand, it's a good news, bad news thing. Uh, by my math, you've only had a 3% positivity rate, which is pretty good. It's below the provincial average, despite the fact that your folks are on the front lines against this thing. On the other hand, you've got a, you've got a scheduling and human resources nightmare happening here. Is that fair to say? Well, I think to be clear, uh, yes, we have very strict screening processes. We have very strict personal protective equipment and personal protective uh, processes. The problem is that not everyone that shows up with a symptom of a cough or a cold or a runny nose or a headache tests positive for COVID, but they all have to be off until we can confirm that they're not positive for COVID. Or not everyone that has been exposed uh, to somebody tests positive for COVID, but they all, all have to be off for a number of days. So it has created a significant amount of issues for staffing. And remember, we need people that can care for sick COVID patients, whether they're in an ICU unit or a step down unit or in our emergency or a general medical floor. So somebody that may work in an outpatient clinic, uh, you know, near the retirement or somebody that is working, uh, doing dressings, they don't qualify for that. So it's those type of nurses that, and, and physicians that, that 
we need across the GTA and across Ontario, and that's where the biggest shortfall is. Okay, I want to talk about fear a little bit here. And Dr. Shul, let me get you into this first. Uh, this is no disrespect, obviously, to any of the healthcare facilities that any of you work in, but the reality is uh, any sane person does not want to be in a hospital in this province right now unless they have to be. I'm talking about as a patient. Uh, I, I want to know how fearful, Dr. Shul, the patients that you see are when they find themselves inside a hospital in an era of COVID-19. Well, I can speak primarily to the emergency department, which is where I work. Um, and, you know, one of the, so if there are any silver linings, and, I, you know, I think we all need a little bit of optimism, uh, it, it is the way in which our protocols have changed, the organization of the hospital and the emergency departments have changed to make them safe. So, in fact, now if you come into the emergency department and you sit in the waiting room, you're going to sit with a with a barrier between you and everyone everyone else in that uh, waiting room, and, and you're going to be physically distanced, and you're all going to be wearing masks. And similarly, as you transit through the emergency department and are, uh, you know, encountering, encountering staff and so on, we are extremely cautious uh, uh, about uh, COVID-19 and preventing contact, both so that the patient remains safe and that healthcare workers remain safe. And uh, remember that many of these patients actually have COVID. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we, we, for the most part, we've not seen huge uh, outbreaks in hospitals. There have been a few uh, larger ones. There was the one in, uh, in London, Ontario, uh, which I think now is under control, which was very concerning. Um, but I think patients should feel safe. The hospitals are safe. Uh, and, uh, and if you need care, go and get care. Um, uh, and I think the other thing that, that they should remember is that there are options. So, you know, again, necessity is a mother of invention, and COVID-19 has led to the development that, or the expansion of virtual options. So, you know, we've seen, and certainly in the first wave, a massive increase in primary care being conducted online, um, as uh, Jennifer was mentioning. Uh, 56 times more virtual uh, primary care visits in the first wave than, than previously. We've also seen the development for the first time uh, that I know of in Canada of virtual emergency departments. So my emergency department and several others now provide virtual emergency department visits. So you can go online and see a doctor, an emergency doctor, um, same day schedule visits. The idea here is that it not be if you've got a primary care doctor, or it's a primary care problem, but for something that you might otherwise have gone to the emergency department, you can get care. And if you need to, the doctor will say, no, you really need to go to the eMERGE for that problem. So, I mean, there are, there. it is safe to go to the, the hospital if you need to, number one, and there are options uh, so that you don't need to go. And I think people should be uh, availing themselves of those. Well, let's follow up with Dr. Kwan on that. What percentage of your patients right now, Dr. Kwan, are you treating virtually as opposed to in person? I would say maybe 50-50. Hmm. Uh, so the things that do need to be seen in person would be, uh, for example, prenatal appointments, uh, well baby checks, immunizations for babies, uh, some presentations such as abdominal pain. It's hard to describe over the phone or virtually. So often I will need to see those patients in person um, and other sorts of various injections or procedures. So 50-50. Uh, the virtual option is actually great for a lot of patients who are scared to go to the office because we can at least discuss over the phone what may need to be done first. And a lot of, uh, especially elderly patients who are worried about catching COVID, that can be quite uh, reassuring for them. And for things such as simple medication renewals. And if it's 50-50 now, what was it before COVID? Well, before COVID, we didn't really have the virtual care options. Um, I would still call patients sometimes if it's something simple, but that was not something that was compensated by OHIP. So it wasn't really an available option for most patients. Uh, so that has been a positive development in uh, the whole pandemic that patients have access to virtual care. And I do hear a lot of positive feedback from patients saying that they appreciate the service. Hmm. Dr. Simpson, let me re return back to that issue of how concerned how fearful the patients that you deal with in Kingston are when they have to come to you for care. What are you sensing? Well, I've had the same uh, virtual care experience uh, that Dr. Kwan described. So in my clinic, it's about 50-50. I try to see the new patients in person and uh, the follow-ups tend to be virtual. Uh, for the procedures that I do, like implanting pacemakers, obviously that can't be done uh, virtually. But even in Kingston, you know, where um, we've been epidemiologically advantaged, I suppose you could say, um, and where COVID rates have not been as high as elsewhere, there still is that same fear. Um, and we saw in our emergency department in wave one, uh, dramatic decreases in uh, the people coming in with heart attacks, for example, I'm, I'm a cardiologist. And it's not that those heart attacks weren't happening, they were 
were happening at home. And uh, now, as Dr. Mohammed said earlier, we're, we're seeing later presentations of, of disease, more advanced cancer. Um, instead of coming in with a heart attack, people are now coming in with heart failure, you know, the consequence, the downstream consequence of a heart attack. So even in places where COVID has not been um, as high, in, in incidents and prevalence, the, the fear is the same. Uh, and I just really wanted to echo the message, you know, I feel safer sitting here in my hospital office today than I do at Costco. Um, the, the vast majority of transmission is, is happening in the community and with the notable exceptions of some outbreaks in hospitals, hospitals are safe and patients who need to be here should still be coming. Let me do a follow up on that because that's a great point. Uh, we have heard that because the province has, in its wisdom, decided to shut down basically all the small businesses in the province, people are packing places like Costco and uh, Walmart and the other, you know, big box superstores. I is that a good idea in your view? Well, I think, you know, the way that I look at it is that COVID is going to spread uh, to whatever extent people are in contact with each other. It's a simple uh, sort of statistical reality or fact that the more uh, one human is in contact with other humans, the more we're, uh, the more COVID we're going to see. So measures that uh, are taken to reduce the number of people in contact with each other is going to be the only way that we can reduce COVID numbers going forward. I get that, but by telling people they can't go to small business locations, where the numbers might be smaller and where the measures taken can be more intense to keep people apart. In other words, no more than 5% typical capacity in a small business at any one time. Because we're not doing that, people are literally just descending on the big box stores in huge numbers. That's not keeping people apart. Does the, is this policy working, I guess is my question. I guess the, the numbers will ultimately be the judge of that. Um, but uh, exactly as you say, you know, well-intended policy that then results in unintended consequences that results in more uh, people being in contact with each other will invariably lead uh, to uh, higher transmission rates. There's no doubt about that. Hmm. Okay, we're down to our last few minutes here, and I'd like to give each of you, I don't know, 45 seconds or so, just to give some advice to the people watching this right now. You have all outlined you know, what the future looks like if we don't get our act together. So Dr. Kwan, go ahead, be the doctor and give us some advice right now. What do we need to do in the next little while? So I just want to reiterate that, you know, if you're having an emergency, you should go to the hospital. I get calls from patients saying, well, I had severe uh, crushing chest pain yesterday and I couldn't breathe and I felt like my heart was pounding out of my chest and I was gonna pass out. But I thought I was having a heart attack, but I didn't want to go to the hospital, so I'm calling you. But the next day, that's not going to be helpful because if you are having a heart attack, you could be dead by the next day. So you should go to the hospital uh, when you think you're having an emergency. Um, and the second part is that I also want to advocate for, um, you know, ramping up of vaccinations across the board in Ontario, um, especially for our frontline workers and for people who may not have access outside of the hospital system. I'm hearing a lot of uh, people, um, you know, even ER doctors working in rural areas saying they do not have access to the vaccine yet. So I'm hoping that will be changing in the next days uh, as soon as possible because, you know, many patients are many doctors are still working with COVID-19 patients and do not have protection. So hopefully, um, you know, we will see the vaccinations ramp up. OK, I, I have an eye on the clock here and we don't have that much time left. So, Dr. Mohammed, if I could get your advice and uh, a little more economically, if I can say that. We're not going to fix this problem in the hospitals. In the hospitals, we're only going to deal with the results of it. Please stay home. Please follow directions. Please stay out of the stores unless you need to go. Please do not travel and please do not gather socially. Thank you. 30 seconds to Dr. Shul, 30 seconds to Dr. Simpson. Go ahead, Michael Shul. I would completely agree with Naveed on the need to follow public health guidance to not tire uh, of these restrictions. We are all tired, uh, uh, but we need to follow the guidance of public health and get vaccinated as soon as you're eligible and the vaccine is available to you. Last word to Ontario Health. I would simply say, you know, that this isn't just about looking after COVID patients. It's about protecting our health system for every Ontarian. And this is a chance for every Ontarian to take an active role, exercise uh, their civic responsibility to help protect our health care system uh, to everyone's benefit. Doctors Simpson, Kwan, Mohammed, and Shul, we are really grateful you could take time out from the very valuable work you're doing to spend some time with us on TVO tonight and help out our viewers and listeners as well. Take good care, everybody, and thanks so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When the Taliban came to power in Afghanistan in the 1990s, some of the great cultural treasures of that country were destroyed. Some, but not all. What was saved through ingenuity and even a little cloak and dagger were movies made as part of a once booming domestic film industry. That story is captured in a new feature length TVO original documentary that has its world broadcast debut tonight right after this program. It's called The Forbidden Reel. It is the creation of producer and director Ariel Nasser, and he is also the interim Quebec producer for the National Film Board of Canada and joins us now from Montreal. Ariel, it's great to meet you. How are you doing? I'm great. Nice to meet you too, Steve. I will be honest with you off the top here, okay? I, you know, when I was told we'd be doing this, I wasn't sure there was a fascinating feature-length documentary to be made about the state of the Afghan film industry over the last half century, but I am delighted to tell you and the rest of the world that you have proved us all wrong. You have told a wonderful story about movie making, about communism and the Taliban and heroism. Anyway, uh, let's play a clip and then we'll come back and chat, okay? Sheldon, Great. if you would. Thank you. The view of Afghanistan outside of Afghanistan is so monolithic. And I think the earlier Afghanistans that existed Afghan intellectualism, Afghan modernism, Afghan leftism, all of these other histories are actually present in this archive. And to see them acted out on film, it really changes the way that people think about Afghanistan. It sure does. Okay, take us back to the moment when some Taliban official gave the sort of off the books order that all Afghan films kept in the archive needed to be destroyed. What happened next? Well, um, this is a moment in Afghan history when you're, of course, seeing a lot of cultural destruction um, by the Taliban and by um, their allies in the country. Um, there was this kind of roving band of extremists, the most extreme faction, perhaps, of the Taliban, who were um, going around the country and destroying cult cultural artifacts. And very famously, they destroyed the giant uh, Buddhist statue in Bamiya. And their next move was to come to the film archive and actually try to burn all of Afghanistan cinema history. And so um, you have this very small group of archivists and filmmakers who remained in the country after most of them had left and gone into exile. And they were, they were um, alerted ahead of time, actually, by a Taliban official who was sympathetic um, and who, despite being a member of the Taliban, didn't feel that all of these films should be burned. And he had tipped off these archivists and they were left with this problem of what to do. And so what they came up with was a plan to hide the archive um, at the risk of their lives. And instead of handing over Afghanistan's film heritage, what they did was they handed over a bunch of Hollywood, Bollywood and, and Russian film prints. And um, that's what the Taliban burned. And fortunately, the rest was seen. I am just trying to imagine the heroism that it must have taken for these people to put, you know, the risk of torture and their lives uh, at stake in order to preserve a half century old industry. How, how do you think they found that strength to do that? You know, it's a really great question. And one of the things that I found through making this film is that um, filmmaking for a lot of these folks, a lot of the, the archivists, the filmmakers, the producers, it was more than just an art form to them it was almost elevated to an ideology. At one point in the film, um, one of the filmmakers says, you know, when I studied in Moscow, my roommate tried to convince me, you know, you're young and full of energy. Why not join the Communist Party? But I always told him that I'm a member of the, of the filmmaking party, basically. So he, they, they really saw filmmaking as something that could change the world and something that came along with, with an ideology, a kind of modernism, a kind of reformism, a way to talk about women's rights, a way to talk about 
um, reform and openness in a country that um, was quite isolated and um, in some ways um, just emerging into modernity. Ariel, let me pick up on that first clip that we played off the top because the, the notion, well, let me put it this way. When people think of Afghanistan today, I suspect the first thing that comes to mind is war. And the second thing that might come to mind is sort of Islamic terrorism. And, and, and probably what doesn't come to mind is the, you know, the richness of the history that is displayed in all of these films. And maybe I think we're going to show just some uh, what you guys in the trade call B-roll here. Uh, what do the films show about the richness of Afghan history as manifested in these films? Well, they, they show a lot of things. Um, one of the things I think that they show is the complexity of Afghan history. And a lot of the time, I think when we think about these different eras of Afghan history, so you had a, a communist era, for example, you had a monarchy era before that. And then afterwards you had a, a they called the resistance era, an era during which the Mujahideen ruled and followed by the Taliban era, is that in every one of these regimes, in every one of these periods, there was a lot of complexity. Um, and so what you'll see in the film is that, for example, during the communist period, we have a communist filmmaker and uh, a Mujahideen filmmaker uh, trading letters across enemy lines and even exchanging films. Um, during the Taliban period, we have this Taliban official who, who saved the films, really, was instrumental in saving the films. And so at every stage, you kind of see this, this great complexity and you see how... Um, um, you know, personal relationships, how passion for art and a shared, um, you know, a shared value for Afghan history really transcends um, some of the other ideologies. There is a bizarre story in your documentary, and I want to take you back to the time, I guess this is the late 1970s, when communism takes over Afghanistan. And a filmmaker wants to sort of depict this, and in doing so, takes the new communist flag down from an important building and puts the old flag up. And there are people who think, oh my goodness, the revolution has failed. We're going back to the old ways. Pick up the story. What happened next? It's true. This is a, a docudrama that was actually being um, uh, directed and starred in by, uh, at the time, um, the, the vice president of the country. And... Um, Basically, they wanted to show the old regime flag coming down and the communist flag going up um, as, as a kind of dramatic sequence in this film about the revolution. Um, but of course, in order to do that, they had to repeat several times. And when people saw um, the communist flag coming down in order to prepare for this scene and the, the old regime flag going back up, people started to talk in the marketplace and, and tell each other that the word got around that um, the revolution had failed. And in fact, the old regime was back. And so you had uh, members of the Khalq party, which was a kind of the hardline communist party that was in power, um, actually shaving off their mustaches in the river in order to kind of repudiate their connection with um, communism and with this, this hardline uh, party. Um, and it's one of the ways it brings some humor and also um, some some tragic notes as well, because um, many of, of these people were, were subsequently executed for their lack of um, loyalty. Um, but it, it kind of goes to the surreal nature of um, some of what was happening in the capital uh, while, while these filmmakers were working. Now, those of us who were around at the time, and I'm going back to 1980 now, well remember the Soviet Union ostensibly at the invitation of the communist government of Afghanistan, invading to help support, this was the explanation, invading to help support the revolution and keep the communist government in place. What did that do to filmmaking in Afghanistan? Well, this is actually very interesting because, um, uh, you know, you have this incredibly damaging war, the Soviet-Afghan war, a uh, massive Indonesian struggle that left as many as 2 million uh, Afghan civilians dead and drove many more out of the country. Um, it really changed um, Afghanistan uh, in terms of what it was and would be in the future. Um, and and um, But at the same time, um, we have this very fascinating and rich documentation of that period in the archives. And 
this is not what we're used to seeing as personally. I grew up here in Canada. My father is Afghan, but my main visual kind of exposure to the country was through the TV. And we would watch the news about Afghanistan and you would see the, the freedom fighters, as they call them back then, the, the Mujahideen, uh, fighting against um, the Soviet Union, the Red Army. And these were the images that you saw. You very, very rarely got to glimpse what was happening inside communist Afghanistan. And so what I discovered through the making of this film, one of the things I, I found in the archive was there's this incredible wealth of material that shows what life was actually like under uh, communist, um, the communist government of Afghanistan between 1978 and um, about 1992. And um, part of the reason for that is that there was an influx of aid for, uh, for filmmaking. Um, as most film buffs know, uh, the Soviet Union uh, supported filmmaking as a, a kind of nationalist uh, enterprise. And um, so Afghanistan was the beneficiary of this huge amount of aid relative to what it had had in the past. So all of a sudden you had this revitalization of the uh, feature film industry in Afghanistan. And you have filmmakers who are making communist propaganda, filmmakers who are trying to make films that actually speak against uh, what the communists are doing and, and the Soviet presence and everything in between. And so uh, that's part of what I've done with this film is just to try and access that and, and bring it to light. Well, I've got to ask the follow-up question then. Of course, the Russians spent more than a decade there and it turned out to be the Soviet Union's Vietnam in a very real way. Once the Soviets were driven out in 1992, what happened to film after that? So in 1992, um, you have the end of this war. Um, the Soviets had actually left in 89, um, c uh, claiming victory. Uh, um, they left the country uh, to the Afghan uh, communist government to try and, and, and survive as long as they could. And they lasted till about 92, when with the end of the Soviet Union, um, their uh, aid, military aid dried up and they could no longer hold out against this growing uh, coalition of um, uh, proxy uh, warriors of, of, of Mujahideen. And um, so what ends up happening is that the Mujahideen come to power and they create a kind of interim government. Um, and um, But unfortunately, there's so much dissent among the various factions of Mujahideen that they, they um, caused a great deal of destruction. So the war actually didn't end. A new war began, uh, the Civil War. And um, Kabul in particular was just completely torn to pieces. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you will see in the film is um, these Mujahideen filmmakers who had really believed in the cause of fighting uh, not only the Soviets, but communism in general and taking Afghanistan back. You see their sorrow as they document the destruction of their beloved city of, of Kabul um, you know, at the hands of these various uh, factions of Mujahideen who are now engaged in a deadly power struggle. Hmm. Much, of course, of your documentary was shot in present day, and I want to know how difficult it was for you to try to get the story out. How much trouble did you have shooting in Afghanistan today? Well, Steve, you know, it's not my first time uh, making a film in Afghanistan. So I've been working there off and on for about 15 years. Um, I started making films in Afghanistan in 2005, my, my very first effort. And um, so over that period of time, I've, I've been privileged to be able to see a lot of the, the changes in Afghan history. And, and um, you know, it, unfortunately, it hasn't, uh, things have not gotten better um, since that time, although there have been progress on some fronts, um, the, the violence has worsened, in fact, uh, progressively. And um, so today, uh, Kabul is far from being a safe place. Um, now, that said, it, it is possible to go there and film if you, if you know what you're doing, if you're careful, if you uh, are surrounded by people you trust. And that's how I approach the, uh, the thing. The, I mean, these guys are friends of mine uh, who I had gotten to know, I've been very lucky to get to know them during a period when I was living in Afghanistan from about 2009 till 2012. And, and um, you know, of course, I wanted to know these filmmakers um, who had been working in Afghanistan documenting the country's history. And in a way, I think I saw myself as being connected with them, you know, because they were, they, were, they were the ones who were making the documentaries in the old days. And um, so through my friendships with them and, and my connection with, with others like them, um, you know, everything was kind of possible. Well, I don't want to let too many cats out of the bag here, but 
One of the people you do interview in this documentary is the daughter of the current president of Afghanistan. And I wonder if you could uh, give us a hint as to how, what's her role in this story? Yes, of course. Uh, Maryam Ghani is a very interesting person. Um, she has been involved with the film archives of Afghanistan for many years, actually going back to 2004. So my intent in, in um, interviewing her and, and bringing her into the story wasn't, wasn't actually so much about her being the, the first daughter of Afghanistan. It was uh, really the fact that, you know, there really aren't very many people who, who are, are experts, who can speak with any expertise on, on Afghan films, especially not in English. And... Um, I also thought this, there was this great juxtaposition happening with her. She's a, a young woman, um, an artist, uh, a professor. Um, she lives in Brooklyn. And yet um, she's formed this very close relationship with these uh, elderly, uh, mostly male uh, filmmakers in Afghanistan. And I thought that relationship was, was interesting to document, um, as well as just, just getting her insight. You know, she's been trying to help preserve the archive for uh, over a decade. And um, so her, her insight is, is very interesting. She kind of has a, a little bit more of a, a, a mixed Western, Eastern Western uh, perspective. And uh, I found she was very on point when it came to talking about these archives. There is a truly extraordinary moment in this documentary when you actually managed to find the Taliban official who warned Afghan films all those years ago that they were about to be destroyed. Let's play a clip of that and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. This gentleman is one of the heroes of the piece who obviously risked his life in order to save a treasure trove of material. I guess a couple of questions here. How did you find him and how did you convince him to speak to you? Uh, good question. I, uh, you know, I have been aware of this story of um, the near destruction of, of Afghan films for a long time because I had, I had known, uh, for example, Engineer Latif, um, who at the time was the president of, of Afghan films, very well, and, and I'd heard the story. But there were always these kind of gaps, you know, there were these little details that didn't quite make sense. There was something missing. And um, the more I investigated this story, the more um, I realized that there was uh, in the involvement of, of a Taliban official. And finally, I was able to identify him just by asking enough questions, enough people, enough questions. And um, I worked with uh, an associate producer I often work with in Kabul to actually track him down and find him. And he, it turned out he was working um, at a radio station, leading a very humble life. Um, but he had, um, uh, you know, re-entered civil life after the fall of the Taliban and was living in Kabul. And so uh, we were able to invite him. And I just thought it would be the perfect thing to have him come to the archive and see how the archivists and filmmakers would welcome him. And when he came, I mean, you really couldn't get two more different groups of people, the, the Taliban and, and, and the folks who work at uh, Afghan films. Um, but they really gave him a hero's welcome. Uh, he was embraced. And, and, you know, as he walked around looking at the films, you could, you could hear how um, sincere he was about caring about Afghanistan's history. So, you know, it's not, um, there, there aren't a lot of points of agreement between him and, and, and the folks who, who he embraces uh, in that scene, but, um, but their love of film uh, is enough to uh, bring them together. Ariel, let's finish up on this. What is the state of the attempts to save Afghanistan's film archives today? 
Well, there has been some change recently um, since the end of production on this film. Actually, the, the films of the archive were moved into a much more secure location. They're now within the walls of the presidential palace compound, which actually is not very far from Afghan films. But um, it makes access very difficult. Um, so, so accessing these films has become extremely uh, hard. But um, uh, the the effort to digitize them is ongoing. One of the things we wanted to help with uh, over the making of this film was digitization. And so we, we donated equipment to Afghan film that would help them digitize the films. And we also brought about 19 films here to Canada, to Montreal, where we digitized them on state-of-the-art equipment at the National Film Board of Canada. So that was a huge um, a boon both for the film and it was a nice thing to be able to give back to the archive. So, so I would say that um, the effort to preserve and digitize and distribute these films is, is, is well underway. And hopefully we'll, we'll be seeing some of these films um, become available in the public sphere at some point. Good stuff. Well, congratulations to you for getting this documentary made. It's called The Forbidden Reel. It's on immediately after this program, and we heartily recommend it to anybody, um, not just film buffs, but also people who are interested in the whole geopolitical dynamic of Afghanistan over the last half century and its culture. So congrats, Ariel, and thanks for joining us on TVO tonight. Thanks, Steve. My pleasure. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, January 12th, 2021. With COVID cases filling intensive care units across the province, some could face tough questions about who gets care. Tomorrow, we'll evaluate this province's protocols for making those life and death decisions. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Pakin's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.